This video is brought to you by Nebula. Libya has had a tough time since the Arab Spring. After Gaddafi's ousting in 2011, it looked like Libya might be on the way to democracy and prosperity. But a few years after its first elections, the country collapsed back into civil war, and has now been essentially split in two separate semi-states for nearly a decade. So in this video, we're going to have a look at how Libya got where it is, why it's still divided, and why some people think it might just be easier if Libya was split into two countries. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. So let's start with a very quick history of Libya. Libya became independent from Britain and France in 1951, and its first ruler was King Idris, a leader from the Senussi clan that helped the British fight against the Italians and Germans in World War II. At its inception, Libya was one of the poorest countries in the world. Most of its infrastructure had been destroyed by war, unemployment was high, and its economy was limited to pretty basic agriculture. This meant that Libyans had a median income of about $30 per year, a 40% infant mortality rate, and a 94% illiteracy rate. All that changed with the discovery of oil in 1959. Libya has something like 50 billion barrels of proven oil reserves, the most in Africa and among the top 10 globally. By 1969, per capita income had gone up by nearly 7,000%, and Libya had a higher GDP per capita than both the EU and US. But corruption was rampant, and many Libyans in the West accused Idris of unfairly favouring the East and being a Western puppet. In 1969, Idris was deposed in a military coup led by Gaddafi, then a 27-year-old Libyan army captain, who promptly proclaimed the creation of a new Libyan Arab Republic. In the first couple of years, Gaddafi was genuinely popular in Libya. Libyans liked the fact that he was anti-Western, and he made more of an effort to distribute the country's oil wealth, mainly by giving out government jobs. He was especially popular in the west of Libya, where many Libyans felt that they'd been ignored by Idris's regime. However, things soured in the early 70s, when Gaddafi became increasingly autocratic domestically and isolated internationally. Gaddafi originally wanted to lead a pan-Arabist movement, but felt unfairly sidelined by Anwar Sadat in Egypt, and disagreed with the Israeli-Arab peace deal signed at Camp David in 1978. Neither the West nor the Arab world liked Gaddafi, and he didn't help himself by constantly sponsoring terrorist groups and fighting the occasional war against his neighbours. President Ronald Reagan famously described Gaddafi as the mad dog of the Middle East, and the US actually tried to assassinate Gaddafi via airstrikes in 1986. Libya was finally placed under UN sanctions in 1992, which did massive damage to Libya's economy, with GDP per capita halving between 1992 and 2002. This all changed after the invasion of Iraq in 2003 and the subsequent killing of Saddam Hussein. This apparently spooked Gaddafi, and he agreed to give up his nuclear weapons program and stop funding terrorist groups to reconcile with the international community. This worked. All of a sudden, Western leaders like Tony Blair, Nicolas Sarkozy and George Bush were touring Libya and doing deals in the desert. The UN lifted its sanctions in 2003, and the Libyan economy returned to growth, reaching a peak GDP per capita of $28,000 just before the financial crisis. Unfortunately for Gaddafi, however, when the Arab Spring kicked off in 2011 and protests broke out in the east of the country, the West changed their mind yet again, and called for him to step down. Gaddafi refused, and when it looked like Gaddafi's government forces were about to reassert control over the country, NATO decided to intervene against him. With NATO support, the rebels beat back government forces, and in October, after NATO used airstrikes against an armed convoy coming out of Gaddafi's hometown, rebels scouring the wreckage found him hiding in a sewer pipe, whereupon they tortured and murdered him. Originally, it looked like Libya was on its way to democracy. A parliament was set up in Tripoli in the west, and elections were held in December 2012. However, the security situation in the country rapidly deteriorated, and in January 2014, the Libyan parliament said they were unable to hold fresh elections. 
A few months later, an army general in the east called Khalifa Belkasim Haftar decided he'd had enough and staged a military coup with what he called the Libyan National Army. This kicked off what's known as the Second Libyan Civil War, which lasted until a ceasefire in 2020. Obviously, what happened in those six years is immensely complicated, but the TLDR is that Haftar and the LNA have maintained control over eastern Libya, including Benghazi, while the UN-recognised Libyan government, today known as the Government of National Accord, have kept control over western Libya, including Tripoli. After a failed offensive by the LNA towards Tripoli in 2019, a UN-mediated ceasefire was agreed in October 2020, with plans to hold fresh elections in 2021. But this collapsed because, fundamentally, neither side is willing to risk their grip on power. Libya now has been split in two for nearly a decade, and some people, including General Haftar, have started tentatively suggesting that maybe Libya should just split into two, or maybe even three countries. In many ways, this makes historical sense. Before it was colonised by Italy, Libya was actually three regions called Tripolitania, Cyrencia and Fezzan. Tripolitania and Cyrencia are the main regions here, because they're where about 95% of the country's 7 million people live. Just look at a population density map of Libya and you'll see that there are two population centres, one around Tripoli in the west and another around Benghazi in the north. Libya's political history has been dominated by this tension. King Idris, who hailed from the east, was overthrown primarily because Libyans in the west disagreed with his proposal to shift Libya from a federal to a unitary state. Similarly, it's no coincidence that the uprising against Gaddafi, who was originally from Sirta but based in Tripoli, began in the east. If Libya were to be divided, it could either be split into three different countries, as it was pre-colonisation, or just into an east and west, with the west basically including both Tripolitania and Fezzan. This wouldn't be easy, not least because the Libyan National Army currently controls a significant part of both Tripolitania and Fezzan, and the vast majority of Libya's oil fields, but given that Libya has now been split in two for nearly a decade, this might be more plausible than the two sides reconciling the differences. Now, if you like this video about Libya splitting into two, then you'll probably be interested in news about other geopolitical conflicts, such as the US and China's rivalry in the Asia-Pacific, which we actually discussed in the daily discussion. There, I sat down with Rory to talk about the intricacies of this regional rivalry to help us better understand what's really going on. In fact, we release these daily discussions, <laughs> well, daily, covering a huge variety of topics in a more analytical and detailed way than is possible in these main videos. The entire series is available exclusively on our streaming service Nebula. If you've been thinking about signing up, then I have some good news. For a limited time, we're offering lifetime memberships. Yep, if you sign up for a lifetime membership, you get access for as long as both you and Nebula exist. Plus, you're also funding new original content from your favourite creators. In fact, if you sign up using our link, then a third of that money goes straight to us, and the rest goes into the pool to develop new Nebula originals with bigger budgets and better production. Now, it's clearly a lot of money, and honestly, the best value plan is still the annual one. But if you really want to support independent creators and help us make even bigger projects, then this is the best option. Again, do make sure you use our link so that they know that you're supporting TLDR. And also, this offer only lasts until the end of the month, with no guarantee it'll ever be offered again. So, if you're interested, this is your opportunity. Anyway, thanks for your support and for signing up to Nebula.